thank you very much for coming to speak to us today. Uh, it's a brilliant movie. I saw it last night. I was very impressed. Thank you. Um, firstly, could you talk about, for anyone watching, you know, what's the film about? And then why, because it's adapted from a Philip Ross novel, why why that novel? Um, mm. What made you want to tell this story? Yeah, you know, Indignation really takes, you know, it takes place in the 1950s. So it seems like a time very, very far away in terms of politics, sexual mores, all that kind of stuff. But weirdly, we're experiencing a bit of a revisit of that kind of paranoia and xenophobia and, you know, just just general crappiness. But that's really not much of a pitch for a movie, is it? Uh, what we do have are young people who are coming squarely against this revised oppressive social order, and in their own particular ways, some tragic, some, un some not, fighting back. Yeah. And they find each other, you know, our young hero, young little uh, Marcus Messner, played by Logan Lerman, uh, Jewish working class kid, first kid in his family ever to go to college, gets a scholarship, Ends up at you know middle of Ohio at this conservative place, and uh, and there meets uh, uh, Sarah Gadden, uh, who's playing Olivia, um, the character Olivia, and the two of them are very different people, but they're also kind of the outsiders, and they find each other there. Mm. Um, it's Philip Roth. Is supposedly, it's a very autobiographical book. Did you consult him at all? And because you adapted the, you wrote the script, didn't you? Yeah. You know, this is one of Philip Roth's later novels. He writes. He's writing this in his seventies, and it's one of his last books. Uh, he's now retired. He stopped writing, mm -hmm. and uh, and it is as in all his work, there are autobiographical elements. But we have to be very careful when talking about Philip Roth. Uh, he uses. You know, it's like, a, it's like in, in mathematics class, remember the asymptotic curve, right? The, the, the closer you get, but still you always stay away. Yeah. And I think that's Philip Roth in his life. Clearly in this book, he's going back to his own college experiences in the 1950s. He went to a place called Bucknell University in rural Pennsylvania. He didn't like it. No. He didn't like it much at all. Uh, but he definitely met a young woman there. There was some kind of encounter that uh, really left a mark. Uh, on him, and I think in late in life he's going back to that encounter and understanding that he at that time had was really somebody again in terms of that asymptotic curve, never really understood who this woman was. Mm. Yeah. So for you making the film, there's so many themes in it, and we touched on a few of them already. So you know, the sexual awakening of a young man um, and girl, really. Um, politics, gender relations. Is, it, is there something particular you wanted to bring out? Because there's lots of things going on. But did you have a you know, I think just an overall sense that um, that uh, being pissed off uh, these days at the world mm -hmm. is uh, a very reasonable re uh, reaction to what's going on. Mm -hmm. And that there are ways to transmute that into something that could be cool and beautiful mm -hmm. uh, and productive and honest. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, would you call it a coming of age narrative? Because yeah. I wondered. Yeah, you know, I think so. I mean, coming of age is such a weird pigeonhole. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, some of my favorite novels and movies are coming of age stories that are people coming of age when they're like in their 50s or 60s or 70s. And clearly I'm a first time director. I'm not young. I'm coming of age. Okay. So I'm also like, whatever. I mean, come on. So there is that, um, that sense of discovery and the sense of surprise that happens with characters who I think, and I hope in the, the, the movie you get this, where everything they do is in character, but it's always a little surprising, mm -hmm. and they're surprised at themselves, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that, I like stories like that, and that, those tend to be coming-of-age stories no matter what the age of the protagonist. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned that this is your first, you know, your, your directorial debut. How did you, did you enjoy it? Because you've done lots of films, obviously. You've worked on so many brilliant films. Mm -hmm. um, did you prefer directing? Oh yeah, look, let's, let's be honest, this directing gig is hilarious. <laughs> it really is. What was I thinking? Why was I producing all these years? You know, just shoveling crap for everybody else. I still am producing. I enjoy producing a lot. And I love working with other filmmakers and kind of helping them get their visions up on the screen. It's still a, a big joy for me. But it, it is absolutely true that this, I mean, whenever I hear directors complaining about whatever, I'm like, oh, come on, really? Really? <laughs> What, what kind of um, inspiration, did you take stylistic inspiration from any particular directors? Who are your guys, yeah. go-to guys? Yeah, here's the thing about that uh, for first-time directors, and I've seen this many times before. Uh, a first-time directors often will 
take templates from other works that they love and they try to, you know, in a sense, not imitate, but be inspired from. I, I, I know I had very, very strong influences and I was ripping off left and right, but I made a pact with myself that I would keep them as subconscious as possible. That say, have no overt homages. I mean, there's a couple. I've stole some shots. They're pretty obvious. If you're into really obscure European art cinema, you'll find them. Um, but I, I really wanted to let those influences happen rather than impose them. So it was only after the film was finished that uh, I would be talking to friends and they'd say, well, what are, you know, same question. What were the big influences? What was the... And I go, you know, it's interesting. For example, I'll give you an example of a director who has never really consciously played a large role in my own formation, but somebody I always admire, but I, you know, it does, it's somebody who doesn't circulate as a big name uh, as much anymore, but I think is actually quite a powerful filmmaker. A guy named Louis Mal, uh, right? It's not like, it's not like you know, Hitchcock's, but Louis Mal, it, it, very funny, I thought, you know, there's certain things in this film that remind me of certain moments in a couple of Louis Mal films, right? Au revoir les enfants, La Combe Lucienne, there's a kind of like weird, they look normal, but then you look at the movie and you're like, well, that, that was weird, Louis. Why, why'd you do that? You know? Hmm. But not when I was making the film. I would never have thought of that. It's interesting. Um, when it came to casting the film, obviously you've got the two key actors, Logan Lerman and Sarah Gadden. Mm -hmm. They're both brilliant, particularly, um, particularly Logan, yeah. I'd say. Yeah. Um, when it came to casting them, were you, because they're not particularly well known, mm. or not yet anyway. Yeah. Um, and then you know, there's another big, Philip Roth book coming out, a uh, book um, yeah. film coming out yeah. this year, and they've got some big names in that. Do we looking to steer away from big <sighs> names? Or I had the luxury, mm. with indignation, of two things. One, we had no money, <laughs> so uh, if we were going to go cast the film, we were going to cast the film either with big names or not. I had the luxury because the budget was so low, of casting the people who we all believed were the best for the role. Mm. There was no real pressure because, quite frankly, we weren't spending the kind of money that other movies make where you have that kind of pressure. So then we had the second luxury of, uh, of being able to choose people who wanted to be in the movie because they wanted to be in the movie because we were not going to, we didn't have trailers. There was no place for people to go between takes. There was nothing, right? We were all just kind of hanging out and having a, we were just making a show. So we got people who A, we loved and wanted, and B, who loved and wanted to be part of the project too. So it was, it was a great experience. Yeah, there were some, there were some very, what, what I imagine were very awkward scenes to film. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how, I mean, how did that play out? Was that, were they, how did it go? You know, people, the thing is, the most awkward scenes, let's just say, for example, sex scenes, um, are also tend to be the most technically precise, specific kinds of scenes to shoot. So that kind of technical thing, getting the lights right, the angles, the camera has to be right, pointed, the, all those things take up so much time, and we didn't have a lot of time on this shoot, that it allows a kind of dissipation of awkwardness because you're so involved in the work that it just becomes part of a flow. So it's very interesting. The hardest scenes are often the ones that don't look the most difficult. They tend to be scenes where, for example, in Indignation, uh, scenes where people are talking and they're not, they don't seem to be saying a lot and it's not that important, but in fact, what's going on is devastating. Yeah. So there's a scene, for example, in a hospital room where the mother of our hero arrives and has a very pleasant conversation with our hero's girlfriend, I guess one would say. And the conversation has no content whatsoever on one level. It's just, what classes are you taking? What's your major? Great, thank you, goodbye. On another level, it's the most heartbreaking scene in the movie because uh, it's, it's, it's a death sentence for this young woman. This, this woman, the older woman comes in, sees exactly who she is, and makes a decision then and there that to more or less destroy her, even though that older woman actually is probably the only person this younger woman has ever met in her life who totally understands her. And in fact, she feels for her. She's heartbroken. She's, she thinks it's a tragedy. Mm -hmm. So it's this terrifying scene. And yet, eh, you know, set a camera and shoot it, right? That's the fun part about directing and about filmmaking in general. I want to talk about the title uh, for mm -hmm. a moment. It's the name of the book as well. Yeah. 
um, indignation. Who, you know, why, why is that the title? Why do you think? You know, indignation is such a funny word, uh, especially in English, because you could translate it as like pissed off. Yeah. You know, I'm angry, but it's not anger. Indignation is a very complicated uh, uh, concept. It's a very complicated emotion because it means on the one hand that you've, in a sense, lost your dignity, right? You're, it's all about that loss of dignity, but it's also then reasserting your dignity through being indignant, right? And so I think that there's um, so many layers. There's the religious and theological, that kind of feeling of shame, but also a sense of defiance against the order, even the order of God, even the order of the universe. So I think there's kind of a, a rebellion against it. And there's a political side to it. You know, Roth is writing this book going into the 2008 financial crisis, which is we're still feeling, obviously, with Brexit and everything else, the results of. Um, so, so at that moment, there's a, a, a political opening that results in the Occupy Wall Street movement, for example. But that movement in, for example, places like Spain was not called Occupy. It was the movement of what? The Indignatos, right? So it, it, it really rises up. Indignation becomes both an emotional and spiritual, but as well as political feeling. And I think that Roth it really had his finger on that pulse. Mm. Definitely, definitely captures, I think, the essence of the film as well. Yeah. I think I've got one last question. Sure. Um, what next for you? What's oh, boy. You know, the good news is I still get to work with all these other great filmmakers. So I'm, I'm working with Ang Lee uh, on what we hope will be his next film. Mm -hmm. uh, I have three other films that I've been producing, executive producing. They'll be coming out next year. Wonderful film from a woman named Kitty Green, a young Australian filmmaker, mm -hmm. called T Casting John Benet. And it's her take on the John Benet Ramsey murder case, really, after O.J., the biggest uh, true crime story in American history. Uh, a phenomenal film from Jean-Stéphane Sauver, who's a really brilliant French filmmaker, starring a young guy named Joe Cole, who we love. He's, I think this guy's a superstar. We shot that in Thailand last year, and that's been a joy to watch come to, come to light. And a uh, first feature by a young Pakistani-American named Aman Abbasi called Davion, which will be coming to screen next year also. So I'm still having fun working with all these other filmmakers, and then I'll probably get around to making another movie myself. <laughs> well, it sounds brilliant. It sounds very busy. Good luck with yeah. all of that. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs>